the repertoire of chants that we have in the evening. There's a lot that seem fairly negative. The body is full of all kinds of unclean things, subject to aging, illness and death, separation. The world is swept away, it does not endure, there's offers no shelter, there's no one in charge. And then there's a switch. May I be happy. Sounds like a when hope in the face of all the negative things in the world, all the suffering in the world. But it's why we're here. We realize that there's a lot of suffering, but there's also a possibility for happiness in the midst of all that. That's our motivation for practicing. And then we extend it not just for ourselves, but may all beings be happy. Our realization that if our happiness depends on someone else's suffering, they're not going to stand for it. So if we want a happiness that's secure, a happiness that can last, we have to take other people's happiness into consideration too. So this is one of the reasons why we try to develop the Brahma Viharas, they call them the sublime attitudes. Every evening before we practice as a group, there's goodwill, unlimited goodwill, the wish for beings to be happy, unlimited compassion. When you see that the beings who are suffering, you'd like to see their suffering end. Unlimited empathetic joy. When you see people who are happy, you want them to continue in their happiness. Or if they're doing the things that give rise to happiness, you want them to continue in those as well. And then equanimity, realizing there are a lot of cases where we can't make any difference. Somebody's suffering, it can be either ourselves or other people, and there are certain things we just can't change. You have to accept that. We learn how to develop that in all cases, too. This is not easy. It's easier to feel goodwill for some people, but not for others, and so on down the line. It takes some work. Try to make our attitude limitless. Now, as the Buddha pointed out, in his previous lifetimes prior to becoming Buddha, he actually developed these Brahma Viharas. And they would take him to the Brahma realms, and then the karma of that practice would run out and he'd be back down on the earth again. So, on their own, the Brahma Viharas can't take you all the way to nirvana, but they can play a role in the path. And the major one is the one I just pointed out just now, is the motivation. And that fits under, in the path, it fits under right resolve. We see that there's suffering that comes from sensuality, there's suffering that comes from thoughts of ill will, suffering that comes from harmfulness. And we want to develop qualities of mind that don't allow these things to take over. And the Brahma Viharas are precisely those qualities. Goodwill counteracts ill will. Compassion counteracts harmfulness. And there's a passage where the Buddha says that passion, <coughs> excuse me, passion is overcome in equanimity. And if your mind is in a state of equanimity, it can't be overcome by passion. If the passion does move in, that means your equanimity has been destroyed. But it is a counterbalance. So if you see that you're engaging in any forms of wrong resolve, you can develop the Brahma Viharas to counteract them. I have to realize, of course, that on the one hand, the Brahma Viharas are not a natural, innate quality of the mind. Ill will comes to the mind just as easily as goodwill. Thoughts of harmfulness come just as easily as thoughts of compassion. This means we have to develop the Brahma Viharas. It's a kind of karma. It's a mental karma. It's a determination, as the Buddha said. And then to stick with it requires mindfulness. So to really understand the Brahma Viharas, you have to understand karma, because they are a type of karma. And when you're thinking about the happiness 
of yourself and the happiness of others. You have to remember that the wish for there to be that happiness requires also the wish that we act in ways that will lead to true happiness. So karma is involved there, too. So the, there's at least a rudimentary element of right view in, in the Brahma Viharas. And they act as the motivation for all the other factors of the path. Our practice of the precepts, right speech, right action, right livelihood. That all depends on our desire not to do harm, our desire for a happiness that gets spread around, a happiness that's harmless. And again, there's wisdom here, too, in the sense that that first question the Buddha says, that's the beginning of discernment. What, when I do it, will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness? What is skillful? What is blameless? Recognizing that our actions are the big thing that leads to happiness, and that long-term is better than short-term. We want happiness that's blameless, i.e., one that doesn't harm anybody. This is an element of right view that underlies the precepts as well. And again, it relates to the Brahma Viharas. And some people find that taking these as meditation objects can provide a basis for right concentration, get the mind in the states of strong concentration. You can think thoughts of goodwill and you can spread it out in all directions. The image the Buddha gives is of a man blowing a trumpet. And the sound goes in all directions. He doesn't have to direct it here or direct it there. It just goes everywhere. That's the kind of quality you want to develop in your mind. And when you have that quality, it has that sense of spaciousness and stillness. It's a thought that doesn't have a lot of internal conflict. Because after all, when we think about true happiness, we realize it has to come from within. So your true happiness doesn't have to conflict with anyone else's true happiness. It's the other pleasures of life where there's conflict. You want that job, somebody else might have to lose it if you get it, or they might get it and you lose it. You want this house, you want this relationship, whatever. There's always a winner and a loser. But true happiness is developed from qualities inside. There doesn't have to be any conflict. This is why goodwill and the other Brahma Viharas can be developed as unlimited. It's not like love. Love is something else. The word for love in Pali, Bema, when the Buddha talks about it, it's obvious it has its drawbacks. He says there's hatred that can come from love. There's love that comes from hatred. In other words, if you love someone and someone else is going to do something harmful to them, you're going to hate that person. There's also love that comes from hatred. In other words, you have a mutual enemy, you become friends. So in the Buddha's eyes, love is not an attitude that you, that you can make unlimited. It's based on making distinctions and creates distinctions many times, whereas goodwill can be more universal. That's why it can be an object of concentration that allows the mind to be still, with a sense of unity. No inner hypocrisy, no inner conflict. So the Brahma Viharas do play a role on the path. But they're not the complete path. Looking over the years at the way the Brahma Viharas are treated in different books on Buddhism, I remember when I was studying my first class in Buddhism way back, they had a book, What the Buddha Taught, and then it was explained the Four Noble Truths. And then at the very end, it kind of tacked on a chapter on the Brahma Viharas. And there was never any sense that the Four Noble Truths and the Brahma Viharas were in any way connected at all. It was just the Buddha's social philosophy. But the way it was organized, it seemed to be expendable. More recently, it got the other extreme. People who say that all you have to do is do the Brahma Viharas, and that's the whole path. But as the Buddha pointed out, they can only take you so far. 
On top of that, you need to have the insight of the Four Noble Truths. Now, you can develop that in a state of concentration that's been developed through the Brahma Viharas, but you need to tack that on, you add that to it, because the Four Noble Truths look not only at the suffering in the world out there, but also look at what you're doing right now. And even in the practice of the Brahma Viharas, there's stress. Now, you're not going to see that if you just sit there generating goodwill. But if you learn how to reflect, the state of mind I've got here, is there still some stress here? And what am I doing to contribute to it? How can I stop? That's when the path becomes complete. So the Mahavahars do provide a rudimentary foundation for virtue, concentration, and some discernment. So they're not just tacked on to the path. But at the same time, you have to learn how to step back from them eventually and see that there's more work to be done. That's primarily the, the function of what they call transcendent right view. The right view that looks at things in terms of the Four Noble Truths. And then can look at itself in terms of the Four Noble Truths. There's a nice passage in John Munn's writings where he talks about how there's a stage in the path where the Four Noble Truths become one. In other words, you see that everything has one duty at that point. You've comprehended stress, you've abandoned the cause, you're beginning to realize the cessation of suffering. You've developed the path. But there's something more that needs to be done. There comes a point where everything has to be let go. Even the path has to be let go. This insight you have, the Brahma Viharas have to be let go. The insight that sees into what's going on in the mind as you develop the Brahma Viharas, that has to be let go as well, along with everything else. So the Brahma Viharas are not a complete path. There's more that needs to be done. But working on them is a good part of the practice. This is why we have the chant every day, to remind us at the very least this is the motivation for why we're here. We want a happiness without bounds. We want a happiness without boundaries. We have to train the mind so it sees that that's a good thing. To really develop, say, goodwill. It's not just a matter of repeating a phrase over and over again, may I be happy, may all beings be happy. You have to think about what that means and what it entails. What does it mean to be happy? What is needed for all beings to be happy? What kind of happiness can I search for that doesn't step on the happiness of others? You want to reflect on that. If you find that there's someone who you have difficulties feeling thoughts of goodwill for, ask yourself, why? What's the problem? After all, wishing that all beings would act in ways that lead to your happiness. That's something you can wish for anybody, even people who have been extremely unskillful, cruel, heartless, damaging to others. You'd like to see that they change their ways. If you can't feel that desire for them to change their ways, what's wrong? Do you want to see them suffer a little bit before they change their ways? Well, why? Ask yourself these questions. In this way, goodwill is not just a pink cloud that you radiate out in all, radiate out in all directions. It becomes a way of contemplating what you understand about happiness and the causes for happiness. And you can dig up any unskillful or poorly thought out ideas about happiness. Now it becomes easier and easier just to think, may all beings be happy and there's no conflict, there's no problem inside. Don't pretend that there are not problems when there aren't. Dig them up. Work through them. That's when 
practice of Brahma Viharas really does become a part of right resolve, part of the path. So make sure you don't just stop with the phrases that we chant. Think them through about their implications, because they can really illuminate lots of the dark corners in the mind, clean them out, so you can get everybody in the mind on board with the practice. You want your goodwill to be unlimited not only toward others, but also unlimited inside you. That's when it really provides strength for the path.